This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. Well, right about now, you're probably taking a little breather in your last-minute rush to get everything ready for the big day tomorrow. Children have to be put to bed to wait for Santa Claus, and there's the tree waiting to be decorated, and four million and one things which must be done before morning. I sure hope you got all your Christmas shopping done. It's pretty hectic rushing off at the last minute to take care of Uncle Charlie or Aunt Bertha or Cousin Sam. But if you must get something... Just remember that you can always dash over to your wine merchant and get a bottle or two of Petri wine. Or better yet, a whole case of Petri wine. Petri wine's a swell gift, and I just thought a little last-minute suggestion might be of some help. And now I'm sure our good friend Dr. Watson's waiting for us, so let's go in and join him. Come in, come in, come in. Ah, uh, there you are, Mr. Bartell. Oh, well, say, Doctor, I can see you're going to have yourself quite a Christmas. <laughs> Big tree in the corner with colored lights on it. Where'd you get those? Table covered with presents? You must be mighty popular. Uh, they aren't all for me, my boy. You see, I'm having a Christmas party tomorrow... For my housekeeper's little nieces. Oh. I'm going to dress up as Santa Claus for them. <laughs> well, I'm sure you look very convincing in the part. Oh, by the way, Doctor, I, uh, I brought you a little present. Ooh, Here it is. I hope you'll like it. <laughs> Good to you, Mr. Butler. I've got one for you, too, here, Summer. Oh, you, you uh, mustn't open it until tomorrow. Here, here you are, my boy. Thanks a lot, Doctor. And uh, now, how's about tonight's story? Last week, you told us you'd chosen an adventure with a lot of Christmassy atmosphere. Yes, Mr. Bartell. My story begins on another Christmas Eve many, many years ago. To be exact, in 1886. At the time the adventure occurred, I must confess I didn't quite understand what was going on myself. In fact, I never did uh, quite make head of tales of it until, until Holmes took pity on me later and explained the, the whole thing. But I shan't try to confuse you, Mr. Bartell. I'll tell you the story exactly as it happened. <laughs> right you are, Doctor. Let's go. Very well. On that Christmas Eve in 86, I was standing in our Baker Street rooms, dressed in the costume of uh, Santa Claus. Holmes, his long, thin fingers pressed together, lay back in an armchair and gazed at me quizzically, while our housekeeper, Mrs. Hudson, stood by the door and... Uh... Dr. Watson, you make a grand Santa Claus. <laughs> Don't you, Mrs. Hudson? <laughs> Try the beard on, Watson, old chap. I'm afraid this is going to be a little uncomfortable. Uh, uh, how, uh, how does it look? <laughs> oh, you look just like the old man on the Christmas cards, Doctor. <laughs> yes, Watson. It really becomes you. The cheery twinkle of the eyes, the ruddy complexion, and the, uh, the appropriate girth. What a shame we can't obtain some snow on a sleigh and reindeer for you. However, I'm sure Mrs. Hudson's nieces will be very much impressed. Well, they will that, sir. And it's very kind of you, Doctor, to offer to come over to their house with me. Oh, with her father in the hospital and my sister at his bedside, it would have been a very miserable Christmas without me. Oh, I shall enjoy myself, but I think I'll take this beard off before we get there. That's it. Are you ready to leave, Mrs. Hudson? I am, sir. Will I get a cab? How far do we have to go? Oh, Lexington Gardens, number 28. It's just off the edge we road, Doctor. Well, not far, but bearing in mind my costume, I suppose we'd better take a cab. Aye, sir. I'll get one. Holmes, what are you going to do with yourself? I hate leaving you alone on Christmas Eve. Oh, don't worry, old chap. I shall spend a profitable evening writing on my new monograph. Well, what's this one about? An analysis of teeth marks on pipe stems, with particular regard to indicated character. Oh, gracious me, how exciting. Well, 
I must be going. <laughs> Don't forget your sack of presents, old fellow. No, no, no. Uh, when you come to distribute them, you'll find that I took the liberty of adding a few trinkets on my own behalf. Oh, that's very thoughtful of you, Holmes. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Holmes, but there's a gentleman to see you. Says he's an old friend of yours. Here's his card, sir. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's Lord Whittacombe. Splendid. Ask him to come up, please, Mrs. Hudson. All right, sir. And I hope your party is a great success, Mrs. Hudson. Uh, thank you, sir. Are you sure you don't want me to stay uh, now that you have a visitor? Oh, no, 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 no. Indeed, no, Mrs. Hudson. I can show the gentleman out myself. You go off and have a good time. Thank you, sir. Oh, I wonder what Lord William wants. Perhaps I should stay. No, no, please, my dear fellow. Certainly not. What? Yeah, you far more important work to do. Well, he can probably wants his revenge at chess. Or something equally innocuous. Off with you, my dear fellow, and enjoy yourself. Oh, I'm going to go. Just the same, I wish you were coming with me. I'll, uh, I'll see you later. I shall be there. Uh, come on up, Whittacombe. Hello, Holmes. Oh, evening, Watson. You make a very convincing Santa Claus. Are you leaving? I'm afraid so, Lord Whittacombe. Well, good night, then. Uh, good night, good night. How are you, Holmes? All alone on Christmas Eve, eh? <laughs> Yes, William, I'm glad you came over to see me. Mm -hmm. What's it to be, an evening of chess, or have you unearthed some recent treasure of medieval pottery that we can discuss? Neither, Holmes. I've come to you in your professional capacity. I I need help. Oh, oh, oh come now, Whittacombe. Don't tell me that after all these years of quiet friendship, you're going to become a client? Yes, I'm afraid so, Holmes. Though I doubt if my problem will, problem will interest you very much. It's hardly up to your uh, uh, rather colorful standards. Uh, care for a cigar? Oh, thanks. Ah. Well, now, my dear Whittacombe, what's your trouble? Well... I decided this year to have a little Christmas party at my townhouse. I'm quite comfortably off, as you know, and it occurred to me that I have several relatives and friends who are not as well off. I'm having a party for them tonight, Holmes, and I hope you'd attend it, disguised as uh, Santa Claus. Oh, my dear fellow, I've adopted many disguises in my time, but Father Christmas has never been one of them. Why do you want me to attend your party in disguise in any case? You ashamed of your friendship with a, a private detective, or um, do you consider my features more acceptable when buried beneath the depths of a snowy beard? Oh, my dear Holmes, do take me seriously. I'm not joking, I assure oh, you. Of course you're not, of course you're not. You, uh, you want me to attend your party in disguise. Why? I'm giving some very valuable presents, uh, diamond and onyx cufflinks, uh, mm -hmm. platinum and ruby earrings, and then such like, and I've wrapped each of the presents in banknotes. Oh, dear me. Uh, where are these presents now? In the sack, in charge of my butler. I was going to dress up as Santa Claus and give them out myself, uh, until I got the warning letter. That's why I've come to you. Warning letter, eh? Yes, I received it by this evening's post. Listen to this. Hmm. My dear Lord Whittacombe, your generosity with Christmas presents borders on ostentation. We do not approve. Neither we receive 5,000 pounds in sovereigns at post restaurant. Box 379 by 6 o'clock on Christmas Eve, or I'm afraid your Christmas party will be conspicuous by its absence of presents. Let me see that note, Whittingham, will you? Yes, here you are. Thanks. Mm hmm. Plain paper, torn from a penny notebook. The writing is obviously disguised, isn't it? By George, yes. Whittingham, I accept the case. I'll come with you to your party at once, and furthermore, I shall follow your suggestion regarding a disguise. Dressed as Santa Claus, I shall be less likely to attract suspicion. I'm delighted, Holmes. But uh, what made you decide so suddenly? This writing, my dear fellow, this writing. Oh, it's uh, in a false hand. I'd know that characteristic M in my dear Whittacombe. I've seen it too often at the beginning of a signature. Moriarty. Moriarty? Who's he? Oh, one of the cleverest and most unscrupulous criminals in England. Whittacombe, there's no time to be lost. It's let me see now. 6.30. Half an hour beyond the deadline given you in this letter. We must go to your house at once. This is as far as the card can take us, Doctor. Well, here you are, Cabby. Here's five shillings for you and a, and a Merry Christmas. Oh, bless you, gentlemen, and a Merry Christmas to you, too. <laughs> uh, you said you wanted to get into the house through the back way so that you could surprise the children. Yes, I thought well, I'd tend to thought... come down the kitchen chimney. Oh, you can get to the back of the house by going up the alley here. 
I'll go in the front door. Splendid, splendid, Mrs. Hudson. Which is the house? Number 28. It's the third one down the alley, Doctor. I'll have the back window open in no time, and you can slip in without any of the barons seeing you. Very well. Uh, gloomy little street, I must say. Hello, well... Where's the music coming from? Oh, it's from that temple across the street, Doctor. The Disciples of the Octagonal Square, they call themselves. What on earth do you suppose that means? Oh, some newfangled cult. Heathens, most likely. Oh, hello, hello. I'm not the only Santa Claus abroad tonight. Look at that fellow across the street over there. Oh, dress just like yourself, Doctor. And carry in a sack, too. Oh, he, he's running up the steps to the temple. Thanks, Scott. He, he slipped on the ice. Oh, I wonder what his hurry was. Here, here, my man. Oh, oh, oh be careful you, now, sir. Doctor. Dinner trip for yourself. Here, you are, now. Give me a hand. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, silly of me, wasn't it? Oh, we Santa Claus and have to help each other, you know. Up you come. That's it. Woo. Oh, oh, gracious oh me. Doctor, I told you to be careful. Oh. Now you've fallen, too. Oh, it's this confounded red coat of mine. It, it tripped me up. Oh. Did you hurt yourself, sir? No, 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 no. All right, I think. Uh, oh. How about you, sir? Well, uh, I'm all right, thanks. Oh. Silly of me to run, wasn't it? Uh, here's your sex, sir. Well, thank you. Good night and uh, Merry Christmas. Uh, uh, good night, same to you, sir. Same to you. Oh, he went into the temple. Must be a disciple of the Octagonal Square. Uh, you're sure you're no hurt, Doctor? No, no, of course not, Mrs. Hudson. Give me my sack, please. Thank you. Your sister's house is the third one down this alleyway, you say? I'll hurry and open the back window. Yes, I'll be waiting for you, Mrs. Hudson. <laughs> this is rather fun. What a shame Holmes isn't with us. Oh, well, he's probably happier having a good game of chess with Lord Whittacombe. This is my house, Holmes, number 39. 39 Bonson Square, eh? And dear old Watson is just around the corner in Lexington Gardens and hasn't any idea that I've left Baker Street. Yes, uh, here you are, Caddy. Uh, thank you, sir. A uh, Merry Christmas, sir. Uh-huh. Listen to that. Carol singers. Yes, we'll probably have our fill of them before this evening's over. Good evening, my lord. Have the, have the guests arrived, Hargreave? Most of them, sir. They're in the library. You brought another Santa Claus with you, I see, my lord. Another Santa Claus? What do you mean? The gentleman arrived three quarters of an hour ago, sir, dressed as Santa Claus. I took him to your study, my lord, and showed him the sack of presents. Confound it. He's got here before us. Where's the study? In this way. I hope I didn't do wrong, my lord. You told me that a gentleman dressed as Santa Claus would be coming here. Dear me, the gentleman appears to have gone. Yes, and the sack containing the presents with him. But he can't have left the house, my lord. I, I've been watching the front door. Yes, and while you were doing that, he slipped out through the window here. The catch is undone. Hargrave, describe this man. Well, I can't tell you much about his appearance, I'm afraid, sir. He was dressed as Santa Claus, just like yourself. But I did notice one thing about him, sir. Oh, what was that? He lisped, sir. It was quite pronounced. Of course. Lou the Lisper. Who on earth is Lou the Lisper? One of Moriarty's most trusted accomplices. Fortunately, though, I've had news of him lately through my underworld grapevine. You, uh, you know where he lives? He is reputed to have some uh, connections with a new cult that calls themselves the Disciples of the Octagonal Square. Their headquarters are just around the corner from here. Let, let's go there at once. Of course, and Hargrave. Yes, sir. Get a message to Scotland Yard as fast as you can. Ask for Inspector Lestrade and tell him to join me at the Temple of the Octagonal Square in Lexington Gardens as soon as possible. Oh, the children are awful excited, Doctor. I told them you just came down the chimney. Oh, I'll slip the beard on and then I'll go into them. Well, will I announce you, Doctor? Yes, yes, please, Mrs. Hudson. All right, sir. Quiet, now, children, quiet. Uh, Santa Claus is coming to see you, and he's brought you all presents. Oh, hello, hello, children. Hello, Santa Claus. My name's Elsie. 
Did you bring me a present? Oh, I, I did, Elsie. I look in my sack in a minute. And uh, what's your name, young man? Herbert, they call me Bertie. Did you come down the chimney? Yes, Bertie. I bet you had a time doing it. You're so fat. Oh, <laughs> don't be rude, Bertie. Or Santa Claus won't give you your present. And what's your name, little man? Maya, though. I've got a cold. Yes, oh. I see you have. Uh, well, children, gather around me and I'll see what presents I got for you. Uh, Let me see, Bertie. Uh, uh, the uh, first present is for... Oh, can't be right. It says for her grace... The Dowager Duchess of Beulah. Oh, do you suppose Mr. Holmes has been playing a practical joke on you, Doctor? I suppose so. Well, I can't see the point, Miss Holt. But he did say that he'd added a few trinkets of his own. I want my present. Then supposing you take this, Elsa. Oh, cool, thank you. And this one is marked for the Reverend Arthur Carter. Okay. I knew what Holmes was up to. Uh, uh, here you are, Bertie. Cool, thanks. And this is for you, Lionel, because... You've been a, a good little boy. This is a very big, is it? I wanted the dog. Oh, I the dog because we're... Well, I'll bring you a dog next year, Lionel. Oh, is he Dr. Watson. Uh, yes, we have... Oh, look at the wrapping on these presents, Dr. Weather. Twenty-pound notes. It's Scott. Oh, oh, look what I got. Now, let me see. Why, uh, cufflinks and Dr. diamond and onyx. Ones, unless I'm very much mistaken. I got pretty earrings. Look how they sparkle. Let me see, Elsie. Oh, good gracious, I swear that these What's are platinum and rubies. What in thunder's going on? I want my earrings back. Give me back mine, too. Well, 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 well here, here you are, here Dr. you are. Dr. Watson, what do you suppose has happened? I don't know, Mrs. Hudson. Perhaps my toys are still at the bottom of the sack. I can't understand it. Oh. I wish Holmes were here instead of dozing in front of our bar in Baker Street. <laughs> Where are you, Holmes? Here by the bed. This is the only room in the temple that gives any signs of having been lived in. I think our bird has been here, but I'm afraid he's flown. If Inspector Lestrade will get here, strike a match, will you, Whittacombe? Right. Ah, here's a candle on the table. Oh, just as I feared. Look on the bed. A red coat and a beard. Yes, Lou the Lisper has discarded his disguise and gone. And with him, I'm afraid, your valuable presence. Oh, wait a minute. Here's a sack lying on the floor. Oh, no, this isn't mine. Look what's in it. A toy dog. Large box of chocolates. Little girl's dog. What in thunder? Well, this is Watson's sack. But how on earth could Lou the Lisper have got hold of it? Somewhere, somehow, he and Watson must have made an accidental change. And Lou the Lisper is no doubt trying to track Watson down at this very moment. He must work fast, Willigam. Or my friend's life and those of Mrs. Hudson and our relatives won't be worth our tinker's damn. <laughs> Now, Doctor, you can't break off your story there. Oh, yes, I can, my boy. Before I go on, I thought we'd have a glass of port just to, <laughs> to freshen us up. Oh, well, that's <laughs> that's something different. Of course. Instead of talking about port, as I <clears throat> sometimes do, it'll be nice to drink some for a change. There you are, my boy, and a, and a Merry Christmas to you. The same to you. And now, what happened next, Doctor? We left you at the children's Christmas party in Sherlock Holmes and Lord Whittacombe around the corner at the Temple of the Octagonal Square. Yes, Mr. Bartell, although at the time, of course, I had no idea what was going on. There I was, cheerfully handing out gifts worth, well, if not a king's, at least a baronet's ransom. While outside the Temple of the Octagonal Square, Holmes and Lord Whittacombe were talking to Inspector Lestrade in Scotland Yard. Not yeah, it seems to me, Lord Whittacombe, you'd have been wiser to get in touch with Scotland Yard when you first got the warning note. If we could have nabbed him when he came to your house and pinched the sack of presents. Mr. Arthur, this is no time for post-mortems. We've got to reach Lou the Lisper before he finds Dr. Watson. Do you suppose he can do that, Holmes? It wouldn't be difficult. Lou the Lisper is nearly as clever as his master, Professor Moriarty. The chances are that you were followed when you came to Baker Street tonight, Whittacombe. And it's equally likely that Watson and Mrs. Hudson were followed as they left it. Moriarty seldom leaves anything to chance. Well, where did Dr. Watson go tonight? 28 Lexington Gardens. It's just around the corner from here. Well, then let's go there at once. Right now, quarry away. No, 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 Lestrade. We must use a little subtlety. Now, Lou the Lisper wishes to recover that sack of presents from Watson. How would he invade the party with the least possible trouble? My, uh, 
Than by dressing up as Santa Claus again. No, no, I think he's overplayed that role for one evening. Well, then how would he try to get in, Mr. Holmes? Oh, come now, Lestrade. What group of people can enter any house on Christmas Eve without invitation and without creating suspicion? You can't Exactly, see my this. dear fellow. I shouldn't be at all surprised if at this very moment Lou the Lisper and some of his gang are singing carols outside 28 Lexington Gardens. Well, then what are we going to do? Form a rival choral society. How many of your men did you bring with you? Three. The sergeant and two constables. Wearing greatcoats? <laughs> yes, Mr. Holmes. But why? Good. They can hide their helmets and pretend to be singers. Come on. Let's go over there, and while we're walking, we'll rehearse our carols. We must appear reasonably convincing. Sound your ray, Lestrade. Sound your ray. <laughs> No, no, you mustn't make Santa Claus too tired, lad. Oh, that's all right, Mrs. Hudson. Hop on, Lyle, hop on. Oh, oh, is that nice? Can't they come inside and sing for us, Santa Claus? Yes, of course they can. Ask them to come in, Mrs. Hudson. Oh, all right, sir. Oh, come on, let me get on your back, too. Oh, no, no, take it easy. Oh, there we go. I want to see your reindeer, Santa. Uh, see my reindeer? Oh, my oh, dear boy, they're up on the roof. Oh. I'll climb up and see them. No, 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 you mustn't do that. They're asleep. Oh, here are the carol singers. Off you get, children. There we go. That's it. Now, good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, and Merry Christmas. Would you like to sing some carols for the children? After that, I'm sure you'd like a drop of <laughs> something to warm you up. Well, thank you, sir. We should like that. Well, haven't I met you before somewhere, my man? Uh, no, sir, I'm sure you haven't. Uh, come on, man, let's sing Good King Went for it. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen. Well, here we are outside the house, Mr. Ohm. Now watch. Listen. Uh-huh. Lou the Lisper and his men are already there. Are we going in now? In a moment. Now, men, you will have your truncheons handy. Yes, Mr. Holmes, we're ready. Splendid. Now, remember, when we're inside and I yell, Merry Christmas, at the top of my voice, you bring out your truncheons and get Lou the Lisper and his gang out of there as quickly as possible. Don't arrest them until you get them outside again, Estrade. I don't want to frighten the children. Right, you are, Mr. Holmes. We're ready. Just give us the word and we'll go in and get them. <laughs> singing, and now, how about something to warm you all up? That won't be necessary, Dr. Watson. See to the door, Sammy. Now all of you, stay right where you are. Who are you? What do you think you're up to? Please don't be difficult, Doctor. All I want is the jewels out of my sack that you sold for me tonight. If you try and stop me, I shall have to hurt you. <laughs> Why do you talk so funny? You got a cold like me? Shut up. Now, Doctor, where are the jewels? Oh, curse it. There are some more carol singers outside. Why don't you go away, Lou? No, better let them come in. If we don't, they might get suspicious. All right, Lou. Listen, know what you're up to. Now, no tricks, Doctor. If you try and give an alarm, I shall have to get rough with you. Well, I don't mind about that, but just remember that there are children present. I am, Andy. You all here before you, eh? Uh, what you say? We all join a little carol for the nippers, eh? Uh, well, uh... All right, uh, w w what what do you want to sing? Uh, better up the old angel sing, eh? Right? Uh, all right, all right. Uh, come on, men. Let's sing. I'll explain it to you later, old chap. Lestrade! Yes, Mr. Holmes? Uh, take them to Scotland Yard and prefer charges. I'll be over in a little while and give evidence. Right you are, sir. <laughs> too bad we didn't catch Professor Moriarty, too. Well, at least we have some of his cohorts. I'll see you later, Lestrade. I wish I knew what was going on here. Is Moriarty mixed up in this business? Yes, Watson. I'll tell you all about it as soon as I've straightened this thing out. 
Now, Whittacombe. Yes, Holmes. The 20-pound notes that you used as wrapping for your gifts seem to have been scattered all over the house. Uh, do you want me to recover them, too? No. From what you've told me of the children, I think their parents could use the money much more profitably oh. than my relatives. In any case, I can replace it. A very generous Christmas gift. Well, children, did you enjoy the, uh, little game we staged for you? It was enough, but... Yes! <laughs> I nearly died laughing when they started hitting each other. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed it, children. And now I, uh, I want you to show me the presents you received. I got these pretty earrings. Oh, they were a part of the game, too. A nice little girl like you doesn't want silly earrings, Elsie. Here's a beautiful doll for you. Cool. Her eyes open mm. chest and everything. And what did you get, my little man? These. Oh, cufflinks. Good gracious. Who wants cufflinks when you can have a, a clockwork train? You want to exchange? Train, Lord, love a duck, yes. I wanted the dog. There's one for you, Lana. A nice, nice woolly dog. Oh, oh. good. And here's a nice... Here you are, Charlie. Here's a nice big box of chocolates, too. You can all share them. Oh, <laughs> Lummy, what a night. Oh. I ain't had as much fun since Granny got her finger stuck in a plug <laughs> <laughs> I, I still don't understand what's going on, Holmes, but I, I must say this has all the earmarks of... It's been a happy Christmas. Yes, oh, well, oh. Mrs. Hudson. Hi, Mr. Holmes. Uh, okay. How's the um, how's the turkey coming along? Oh, it'll be ready in a few minutes, Mr. Holmes. Splendid. And, <laughs> and while we're waiting, perhaps the children will oblige with something we haven't heard so far. Mrs. Yes, Mrs. I know what you mean. A Christmas carol that really sounds convincing. How about it, children? All right, sir. Come on, Elsie. Come on, Lionel. Die, die, Doctor, that was really a, twelfth, a swell story. On a Christmas Eve like this, do you ever wish you were back in Baker Street celebrating Christmas there? At times, yes, but actually, Mr. Bartell, I'm, I'm very happy right here in my little home. There on the table is a beautiful little Christmas tree. There's a fine fire in my fireplace. My two dogs, Monty and Willie, are, are sleeping peacefully at my feet. And best of it all, I've got the love of every child in the, in the neighborhood. Yes, I got a great deal this Christmas Eve. Lots to be thankful for. And what with the troubles of the world on their way to being settled, it looks as if this is the brightest Christmas that, that I've ever had. Well, that's how I feel about it, too, Doctor. I hope that all our friends listening in are just as happy this Christmas Eve as we are. And speaking not only for myself, but I know for all of us and for the Petri family, too, we wish every one of you a happy Christmas from the bottom of our hearts. God rest ye merry, gentlemen. Well, Dr. Watson, next Monday is New Year's Eve. What story do you plan to tell us? One that I think you'll find extremely appropriate, Mr. Bartell. It takes place in a Scottish castle near Edinburgh on a New Year's Eve in 1900 and concerns a pair of lovers, an elderly baronet, and a, a strange iron box that proved to be more than worth its weight in gold. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Blue Carbuncle. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. <laughs> Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.
the makers of Clever Craft Clothes for Men, and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Well, here we are, about to enter Dr. Watson's familiar study. Hello, what's this? We find the good doctor hanging up his Christmas holly. Not forgetting a sprig of mistletoe, Mr. Harris. <laughs> <laughs> Hope springs eternal, as they say. But here, help me down from this chair. My old legs aren't as agile as they were in the days when I followed Holmes through the dungeons and up the tower stairs of old Pensdagen Castle. Here we are. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that sounds suspiciously like the beginning of a Sherlock Holmes yarn, Dr. Watson. It is, Mr. Harris, it is. Holmes always called it the adventure of the Christmas bride. It concerns a ghostly lady in white who was supposed to have disappeared centuries ago. The honor of a noble family and a certain Father Christmas who suddenly sang bass. And now, while I fix us both a yuletide, Tori, suppose you'll tell our friends and listeners about a gift every man in our audience would welcome from Father Christmas, or as you Americans call him, Santa Claus. With pleasure, Dr. Watson. And not only from Santa Claus, a thrifty man can give himself a worthwhile gift any time if he insists on clipper craft. For Clippercraft clothes, keep on giving for a long, long time. First of all, you've never seen such truly fine clothes at such really low prices. That means you pocket the savings. That's the first gift to yourself. And they also give you superb styling, perfect fit, and long wear. Clippercraft clothes give you so very much because of the unique Clippercraft plan, concentrating the buying power of 924 of the nation's leading stores from coast to coast. That means tremendous savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. And yours are the savings this brilliant plan makes possible. Clippercraft suits are only $40 and $45. Clippercraft top coats and overcoats only $40. And sport jackets only $26.50. Clippercraft values are so amazing, we urge you to compare them with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, how about that Christmas bride, Dr. Watson? Her name was Ginevra, and she was the heir and only child of Lord Robert Neville, 10th Earl and 54th Baron Pensdragon of Pensdragon Castle. Yes, I shall never forget my first glimpse of that ancient and somewhat forbidding edifice. The walls gray and bleak without their summer covering of ivy. The tower square and defiant with the red or rouge dragon pennant angrily defying the winter gales. Well, as I was saying, a rather urgent message from Lord Neville on elegant embossed stationery had arrived at 221B Baker Street. Would Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson do him the honor of a visit to Penn's Dragon over the Christmas holidays? The visit to include the wedding of his daughter, Lady Ginevra, to the immensely wealthy but slightly middle-aged Wentworth Trimmingham, which was due to occur on the second day of the new year. Now, don't tell me the eminent Mr. Sherlock Holmes was called in to guard the wedding presents, Dr. Watson. <laughs> Hardly, Mr. Harris. At any rate, the day before Christmas found us alighting from our train at a small station in the Cumberland Hills, which, as you know, are situated in the north of England. There had been a slight fall of snow. An ancient carriage with red wheels and the Neville arms on the door was drawn up to the station platform while the anxious face of the Lord of the Manor himself, in top hat and earmuffs, peered through one of the steamy windows. Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. That's right. Uh, this way, gentlemen. His lordship's expecting you in carriage. Quite a fall of snow you've had here. Aye, sir. More are coming. By rights, we should have brought the sleigh. Only his lordship loaned it to the vicar for tomorrow night. Vicar always plays fire to Christmas at the hall on Christmas Eve, I know mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson, sir. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'll hop in before you freeze to death. Thank you. Are uh, you here, Mr. Holmes? Uh, your friend opposite. Ah. And now then, Dennis, back to Penn's Dragon as fast as you can. Aye, my lord. Ah. 
Mr. Holmes, you are doubtless curious as to why I've invited you and Dr. Watson to share our Yuletide celebrations with Hens Dragon. To be quite honest, Lord Neville, I didn't think it was entirely for the pleasure of our society, although Watson is quite an asset when it comes to carol singing. Oh, tenor? No, certainly not, baritone. Oh, oh, that's good. The vicar who leads the Christmas singing is rather proud of his tenor voice, and I may say he's not too fond of competition. No. Uh, Mr. Holmes... I have invited you to Penn's Dragon to make sure that nothing, nothing occurs to prevent the marriage of my daughter to Mr. Wentworth Trimmingham. Why is that marriage so imperative, Lord Neville? Well, to be brutally frank, Mr. Holmes, the Neville estates are mortgaged up to the ears. If the marriage does not go through on the second of next month, I shall be bankrupt, totally bankrupt. I see. Has anything occurred, Lord Neville, to make you fear that this marriage may not take place? Well, no. That is nothing definite. Perhaps the Lady Ginevra hasn't been able to hide her distaste for the match. Oh, no, no, no. Nothing like that. Well, I, I wouldn't say it was a passionate attachment on either side. But they, they like the same things. She laughs at all his jokes. What better foundation could one ask for a marriage, Jay Watson? Well, that's what I should have said. Well, everything was as smooth as silk until the Dowager Duchess of Turf gave the engagement dinner last month. It was at her suggestion that I sent you the invitation to Penn's Dragon. She's been decidedly edgy ever since Percy returned in the midst of the betrothal dinner two weeks ago. Percy? Yes, Percy is my cousin, although he's only seven years older than Ginevra. He's our next of kin. See. As a matter of fact, he's an orphan and lived with us at Penn's Dragon until he went off to Canada to seek his fortune two years ago. If anything should happen to your daughter before she produced an heir, would Percy Neville inherit? Yes, Dr. Watson. Both the title and the estates. Percy Neville's return was unexpected, I gather. It was. Unexpected and melodramatic, to say the least. The betrothal dinner was being held in the great hall of Penn's Dragon Castle. My daughter had just risen to return the bridegroom's toast. As she lifted her glass, a casement window was thrown violently open, and Percy walked in out of the night. And now I should like to make a toast to my future bridegroom. Percy! What is it? What is it? Good heavens, Percy, is it really you? I'm sorry to make such an abrupt entrance, yes. Lady Terse, but I came as soon as I received news of the engagement. Percy, why didn't you let us know you were coming? Let you know? Let you know when you never bothered to answer my letters? But, Percy, we never received any letters. We, we thought you'd forgotten us. I have forgotten, as if that would have mattered. Percy, that's not true. You know how fond I... we are of you. How touching. Percy, this is Wentworth. Wentworth Trimmingham, my future bridegroom. So, this is the little man they've sold you to. Stop that. Stop it at once. I'm very fond of Wentworth. Are you, my dear Geneva? Percy, why do you look at me like that? To think you should so soon forget our family motto. Ne vile velis. The name Neville means that, you know. Ne vile velis. <laughs> Let it, I take it, eh, Holmes? Quite. It means stoop to nothing base, in case you've forgotten your Ovid, Watson. Oh, teach your grandmother to suck eggs. Tell me, Lord Neville, what happened after Percy quoted the family motto to your daughter? Uh, he stamped off to his old rooms in the tower and hasn't been out of them since. How does the Lady Ginevra react to this unfriendly behavior? Oh, she says let him sulk. It's no concern of hers. Lady Terse, on the other hand, is thoroughly unnerved by Percy's return. Oh? As she feels sure he'll do something outrageous the day of the wedding... Poor Wentworth is as edgy as a hen on a hot griddle. Well, of course, that may be due to his encounter with the white lady. White lady? Who's she? The ghost of the first Ginevra, you know. The bride who played hide-and-seek on her wedding night and was never seen alive again. Years later, her skeleton was found in her great dower chest, still dressed in her wedding gown. She'd hidden in there, and somehow the hat must have fallen down, and she was locked in and smothered to death. See, Mr. Me, I remember a rather famous poem on the subject. Oh, yes. So all the Ginevras and the Neville family have been named after her. She's supposed to walk through the halls of the castle whenever a misfortune is due to occur. Oh, cheerful damsel, eh, Holmes? When and how did Wentworth Trimmingham meet the lady? Well, Mr. Holmes, it seems it's his habit to knock on my daughter's door on his way to bed to wish her good night. Last night, the wind was rather high and he couldn't seem to make my daughter hear. Suddenly, he heard a strange creaking noise down the corridor behind him. Looking round, 
he saw the lid of the dower chest rise slowly. Ginevra. Ginevra, my dear, it's I, Wentworth. I've come to bid you good night. Ginevra, are you there? Ginevra! What was that? Good Lord, the, the, the lid of the chest is rising. There's something. A woman in white. She's rising out of the chest. Who, who, who are you? The fool Ginevra. You call to me. So I have come to warn you. Go away. Go away before it is too late. Then what happened, Lord Neville? For nothing, Mr. Holmes. Apparently, the white figure glided past my daughter's fiancé and disappeared up the tower stairs. Hmm. What did the lady look like? Blonde, brunette? Uh, Wentworth says her features were hidden by the bridal veil. Yes. Interesting. I suppose anyone in the house would have access to that tower chest. On the contrary, Mr. Holmes. Too many people are possessed of insatiable curiosity. I keep the silly thing safely padlocked, I promise you. How many keys are there to that padlock? One which I keep by me here on my hearing. A very wise precaution. I say, Holmes, your bed is even larger than the one in my room. The butler tells me Queen Victoria slept there when she paid a visit in 1846. Don't look so superior, Watson. Queen Elizabeth, I'm told, slept here quite a few years before that. Oh. Come in. Oh, Lady Tuss, beautiful and charming as ever. Stop the nonsense. Glad to see you, both of you. Something's going on here. Don't like it. What sort of something are you referring to, Lady Tuss? Don't know. If I did, shouldn't have sent for you. Ginevra looks as if butter wouldn't melt in her mouth. Bad sign. Percy looks like a thundercloud. That's worse. I thought Percy had locked himself in his rooms and refused to see anyone. I'd like to see anyone refuse to see me. Oh, but I'm Gavin. Uh, you'll want to view the premises. Yes. First of all, I'd like to inspect that dour chest. It might be interesting to investigate how a lady in white can emerge from a carefully padlocked coffer. Then you don't think it was a ghost. Neither do I. Well, what was she up to? You should be able to answer those questions better, Lady Terse, after you've had a look inside that box. I wonder if you could persuade Lord Neville to lend us the key. Here's the key, Mr. Holmes. Lord Neville insists I bring it back the moment you're finished with it. Oh, suspicious old boy, eh, Holmes? Not suspicious, Dr. Watson. Fussy. Well, Mr. Holmes, why the delay? Open the silly chest. Let's see what's inside. So fast, Lady Turse, not so fast. First, let's have a look at the lock. Heavy old bit of machinery. Yes, yeah, almost impossible to pick it without showing signs. There are no signs. Then whoever opened it used that key. Not necessarily, Watson. But there's only one key. Lord Neville told us so. And if Robert says a thing, it's gospel. Yes. Interesting carving around the lock. The wood's very old. Mm, naturally. Open it up. I'm dying of curiosity. Very well. The lock needs oiling. It hasn't been unlocked for some time. I'll remove the padlock. Here, Watson, hold it. Now, Lady Terse, if you'll help me raise the lid. Right. Good Lord, what's that? Oh, it's Thor, Ginevra's spaniel. Goes everywhere with her. Regular shadow. Oh, yes, here she comes. Hello there. I'm Ginevra. Why, you must be Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Delighted. Don't let me stop you, Mr. Holmes. You won't. Father told me what you're up to. I'm dying to see what's in the chest, too. Go ahead, open it up. Down, sword, down, boy. You see, it's a biggish box, isn't it? Yes, a woman could easily hide in there. Hmm, something uh, white and uh, satin lying on the bottom. Wonderful. It must be her wedding dress. I've always heard it was still in there. Remarkable to find it in such good condition after all these years. The remarkable thing about it, Lady Ginevra, is this dust and dirt on the hem. Watson, give me an envelope. I shall want to take a sample. But that's fascinating. I've heard simply fabulous things about you, Mr. Holmes. And now I believe them. Every one. Do you? Yes, I think we've seen everything there is to be seen here. Watson, you may close the lid. And lock it. Right. Uh-huh. 
So this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and his famous deductions. They told me you were coming. They? Who's they? I understood you'd let no one in here, not even the maid. You've overlooked Lady Terse. Try to keep her out of anything. I didn't mention Mr. Holmes, Percy. Or did I? Don't look so suspicious, Lady Terse. I've decided to be a good boy. I've even decided to come downstairs tonight and join in the Christmas Eve festivities. Percy, that gleam in your eye. I've known you too long. You're up to something. If you want to know what satisfying people really means, ask any man who wears Clippercraft clothes. He'll sing their praises, with good reason, too. For values like Clippercraft amaze even clothing experts. Until you see Clippercraft clothes and try them on, you won't believe such really superb suits are possible at only forty and forty-five dollars, and such rich, long-wearing top coats and overcoats at only forty dollars. Such very smart sport jackets at only twenty-six fifty. For just a fraction of what you'd expect to pay, you get correct styling, perfect fit, and long-wearing materials. An ingenious plan makes this all possible. The Clippercraft Plan, which concentrates the buying power of 924 of the nation's leading stores from coast to coast. You get the savings that result from this group buying at your own local independent store, the store you can trust. Selling inexpensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft Plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. Ginevra, he'll be here. But Percy, the snow's so deep. What if he can't get through? Now, don't worry. The sleigh is light and he has Vixen, the best horse in the county. Nothing can pass her, you know. Oh, dear, I hope so. The snow fell down. What ails the dog? He may prove to be a bit of a problem, don't you think? Goodness, I hope not. To... Oh, Mr. Holmes, I didn't see you behind that chair. An ancient wing chair often provides a good listening post, my dear. Now, look here, you meddling busybody. Percy, please, you promised. Suppose you allow me to solve the problem of the dog, Lady Ginevra. Would you? I mean, listen, say, Bell, the vicar's driving up. He's here. Father Christmas has arrived. Open the door, Paddleford. Now then, everyone. Good King Wenzel's has looked down on the feast of Stephen. When the snow lay round about, he went to the island. My right ears half frozen. Come along, Father Christmas. Percy will take you into the dining room. You can have a hot toddy while you get out of your rack. That's a good idea. A good idea. And um, better disguise your voice, sir, or all the children will guess who you are. Uh, that's a good idea, too. Uh, 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 gather round, all. Uh, bring in the Yule log. <laughs> Father Christmas will be with you in a moment to give out the presents to all the good boys and girls. <laughs> there. Uh, how's that? Vicar, you're wonderful. Now go along. Take good care of him, Percy. Never fear, my dear. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, they're bringing in the Yule Lord. Come and help me set fire to it. Oh, a whole book, Dr. Watson, has caught Lady Terrence under the mistletoe. I declare I've never had such a Christmas. Oh, come along, Ginevra. They're ready for you to light the fire. Oh, dear, where did I put the matches? Well, oh, I'll Lady Ginevra. Oh, thank you, Dr. Watson. Oh, oh I say, I say, Holmes, how she burns, Oh, eh? lovely. I do like to toast my feet in front of a Yule log. I beg your pardon, Lady Ginevra, but haven't you raised your skirts a bit too high? Oh, my goodness. 
I forgot. Oh, Ginevra, my dear, your fiancé is making quite an ass of himself. He runs into the library every other minute to see no one's listed one of the wedding presents. Well, all that silver and your present, Lady Turf, the diamond tiara. I'll admit that tiara is a temptation. You shouldn't have given it to me, Lady Turf. It's wonderful. Oh, not at all. A confounded nuisance. Given me a headache for years. Glad to be rid of it. Oh, here, here comes Father Christmas. Gather around the punch bowl, everyone. And we'll have a drink or so before we give out the presents. Oh, I say, what? Oh, oh, no, we should. That's the ticket. I say, though, because Father Christmas, I mean, a start us off on a carol. Can't drink your eggnog without a song. Right you are, fair lady. God bless you. Father Christmas, not leaving us so soon. Well, uh, that is uh, a long ride home. Must get going. Uh, don't tell the others. Uh, wouldn't want to disturb the party. Quite. How about a hot toddy before you leave? Still a cup, you know. No, I haven't time. I haven't time. I thought you might say that, so I prepared this jug full of grog. Keep it well wrapped. It'll keep you warm. It's a long, cold drive to Gretna Green, but... What, Mr. Holmes? No time to waste. On your way, Father Christmas. Think of me when you drink the grog. We will. Wassel! Wassel! Merry Christmas! And a happy new year. Hello, what's this? Is Vicar off so soon? Uh, yes, Lord Neville. He seemed in a hurry to get home. Oh, can't blame him. It's a cold night. Uh, let us get inside before we freeze to death. Good idea. Oh, I say, oh. they're ready to start the dancing. Uh, Wentworth's trying to find Ginevra so they can leave the dancer. Help! Help! Oh, who's that calling? Oh, good heavens, what is that? Get me out! I'm locked Why, in. someone's got himself locked in the dungeon. This way. The entrance is through the dining room. I was hoping for more of a head start. What's that? Nothing, nothing at all. Ah, this is the door to the dungeon. Let me out! Let me out, I say! Yeah, the door is bolted. Just a moment. Ah. Get me out of here! Good Lord! It's the vicar down there in his underwear and trussed up like a New Year's goose. This is an outrage! Get me out of here! But if the vicar is here, who drove off in the sleigh? Presumably an imposter who stole the vicar's clothes. I thought it might be, you know, when I heard Father Christmas sing bass. Say, Holmes, Holmes, where are you? Lady Ginevra, her fiancée can't find her anywhere. She's disappeared, vanished into thin air. Great Scott, someone get the vicar out of the dungeon. I've got to find my daughter. <laughs> oh, Mr. Holmes, come quickly. Ginevra's disappeared. Her dog is crouched in front of the dower chest, howling. Oh, hurry, gentlemen. The same scoundrel that locked the vicar in the dungeon has undoubtedly put Ginevra in the dower chest. Oh, no, hopefully not too late, eh, Holmes? Trentworth tried to break the chest open, but the dog won't let him near. There, I see. Easy, 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 Thorpe, boy. Yes, 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 I know, I know what you're trying to say. We'll get her out. Oh, confound it, this key. Lady Terse, what did you do with the key? But I gave it back to you. No, you didn't. Oh, yes, you did, too. Quite all right, you know. No key needed. The wood's so old and the staple's so loose, it's quite possible to lift the lock right out, like this. That's it, I'll raise the lid. Oh, great Scott, there's nothing in there but a roast of beef. Yes. Thor's made off with it, I'm afraid. That explains his interest in the chest. But if Ginevra isn't here, where is she? With Father Christmas, I imagine. They're heading for the Scottish border in the sleigh. You'll never catch them, I'm afraid. Oh, of course. She's eloped with Percy. So she did talk him wrong. Good for her. <laughs> So that's why she trailed off up the tower steps in that old bridal gown. I suspected as much when I discovered some of Percy's ashes on its hem. Ah, oh, but this is dreadful. I should be ruined. We'll have to return all the wedding presents. Fiddle-dee-dee. Personally, I'll make mine a much handsomer contribution. Ginevra shall have the tiara and my emeralds as well. They're worth a king's ransom. Lady Turf, you are an astounding female. So women are. Oh, but we're keeping the dancers waiting. You shall lead the lancers with me, Robert. Come along. Say, Holmes, you old fraud. I believe you knew you, what was going on all the time. I suspected, Watson. I suspected. 
But when I saw the Lady Ginevra raise her ball gown and display a pair of traveling boots, I was sure. But uh, come along, Watson. We shall have to go down to the kitchen and make peace with the cook. Oh, why that? For making off with Sunday's roast of beef. Something had to be done to keep the dog interested, or he'd have given the show away. Well, that certainly was a Christmas story with all the trimmings, Dr. Watson. Glad you like it, Mr. Harris. And now, while I fill up our glasses... So we can drink a Christmas toast to our listeners and our sponsors. Nothing would give me greater pleasure, Dr. Watson. Ah, here's your glass, Mr. Harris. Thank you. And here's to our radio friends, young and old. Merry, merry Christmas and happiness, prosperity and peace in the new year. Indeed, Dr. Watson. And warm greetings to all the makers of Clippercraft clothes. And now, Dr. Watson, how about just a small hint about next week's story? Next week, I think I should tell you how Holmes and I spent New Year's Eve off the Silly Isles. <laughs> New Year's Eve off the Silly Isles? That sounds amusing, Doctor. Hair-raising is the word, Mr. Harris. We were aboard the luxury liner Gigantic, expecting that any minute she would burst into flames. There's nothing more terrifying, you know, than a fire at sea. <laughs> Makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 924 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clipper Craft dealer, write Clipper Craft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Christmas seals support the fight to prevent the spread of tuberculosis in this community. Buy and use Christmas seals on all your holiday mail, and be sure to mail your packages now. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in New Year's Eve off the Silly Isles. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcast in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer, and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. Speaking for Clipper Craft Clothes, this is the world's largest network, serving more than 450 radio stations and mutual broadcasting systems. From New York, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men. And 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Meiser. Well, here we are once again on the threshold of Dr. Watson's study. We find Mr. Holmes' genial biographer strutting up and down in front of his fireplace. Evening, Doctor. You look fit. The Christmas festivities don't seem to have got you down. I am fit, Mr. Harris. Very fit. Better than that, I am rather well fitted. Oh, great Scott, man, where are your eyes? <laughs> Why, Dr. Watson, don't tell me Santa Claus brought you a clipper craft suit. Well, why not? Just because I'm a wee bit uh, venerable doesn't mean I'm antique. I still enjoy making a good impression, don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, in that suit, it'll be the girls that go <whistles> when you walk down the street. Oh, <laughs> but, seriously now, Doctor, suppose you tell us what tonight's story is to be about. Well, tonight I thought I'd relate how Holmes and I spent New Year's Eve off the Silly Isles. The Silly Isles? That sounds appropriate, Doctor. The name of these particular islands is spelled S-C-I-L-L-Y. They are located roughly a hundred miles southwest of Land's End, Mr. Harris. Oh, what in the world were you doing there on New Year's Eve? Trying to prevent a great maritime catastrophe. You remember what happened to the Titanic? You know what happened to the Lusitania? Well, the lives of those on the ocean liner Gigantic were in even greater danger... When Holmes and I went over the side on New Year's Eve in the year 1912... Uh, oh, but good heavens. <laughs> there I go, getting ahead of myself again. 
Suppose I fix us a Tom and Jerry while you tell our listeners how to start the year right in a clip of trout's clothes. Fair enough, Dr. Watson. Millions of men, like you, will start the new year in a smart new Clippercraft suit and overcoat. Yes, today more men than ever before wear Clippercraft clothes. For we've sold more Clippercraft clothes than ever before in our entire history. There's a reason, of course. The wise old American public, with its eye for value, has pronounced Clippercraft the most remarkable clothing buys they've ever seen. The reason for these amazing values is the sensational Clippercraft plan. Concentrating the buying power of 924 of the nation's leading stores from coast to coast, it accounts for tremendous savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. That's why true fine Clippercraft suits are only $40 and $45. Why Clippercraft top coats and overcoats are only $40 and sport jackets only $26.50. Clippercraft values are downright amazing. Compare them with clothes selling for many dollars more. Dr. Watson, to return to the New Year's Eve, you and Sherlock Holmes celebrated on the good ship Gigantic. Yes. Uh, oh, here's your Tom and Jerry, Mr. Harris. Thank oh, you, Oh, be Doctor. careful. Don't burn yourself. Yes, it was probably the most hectic New Year's Eve I've ever experienced. Nothing is as terrifying to a seafaring man as the thought of fire aboard ship. Panic. The isolation. Oh, but that's neither here nor there. Yes, let me see. It was the last day of the year, 1912. Its inception was sufficiently placid, I must say. A light snow was falling as Holmes and I seated ourselves on either side of a well-filled breakfast table. The flames of our sea-coal fire reflected themselves cheerily in the generous coffee pot. The whole house was filled with the pleasant aroma of the stuffing Mrs. Hudson was preparing for our New Year's goose. Suddenly there came a frantic jangle at the front door bell. <laughs> No, definitely no. No, what, Holmes? Whoever it is that's pulling our front doorbell out by the roots, whatever his problem is, I'm definitely not interested. Yes, Watson, being the world's greatest consulting detective has its disadvantages. People always manage to get into difficulties at the most inopportune moments. Yes, you should try being a doctor, Holmes. No female since Eve has ever decided to become a mother at a convenient time. Oh, come in, confound it. Mr. Holmes? <coughs> Mr. Sherlock Holmes? <laughs> Naturally. Whatever your problem is, I warn you, it'll have to wait till after the holidays. But it can't, Mr. Holmes. Close to 2,000 lives are at stake. I pray to heaven you'll be able to reach them before it's too late. Reach whom? Where? And what is this disaster you anticipate with such trepidation? The steamship gigantic, Mr. Holmes. She should be somewhere off the Silly Isles by midnight. We've been reliably informed that an attempt will be made to set fire to her at that time. If successful, it'll be the greatest disaster in all maritime history. Yes, in that case, I suppose I shall have to forego the little celebration I'd planned for this evening. Have to? Well, really, Holmes, you are a cold-blooded fish. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't believe you've met my colleague, Dr. Watson, Mr. Uh, uh, Pembroke, Reginald Pembroke. How did you do, sir? I'm chairman of the board of Floyd's, the famous insurance company. Oh, then your desire to prevent this uh, disaster isn't entirely humanitarian. Not entirely, but neither is it altogether mercenary. There's more at stake than the lives of the passengers on board the gigantic. If she goes down, the financial stability of the British Empire goes with her. Interesting, eh, Watson? Continue, Mr. Pembroke. You may be aware, Mr. Holmes, that during this past year, there have been a terrifying number of marine catastrophes. Uh, Holmes knows everything, Mr. Pembroke. I am quite cognizant of the fact that quite a few of the newest and fastest British liners have been destroyed at sea by fire, storm, and uh, accident. Ah, they weren't accident, Mr. Holmes, I assure you. Quite. The Egyptian star was destroyed by fire in the Persian Gulf. 800 lives lost. The Lord Nelson disappeared in a typhoon in the Indian Ocean. No survivors. The Southern Cross exploded and sank off the coast of Brazil. 1,200 casualties. The Wellington, the Lady Jane Grey, and the El Dorado all caught fire in different parts of the Pacific. Total deaths, over 2,000. But the greatest disaster was last April, when the Titanic ran into an iceberg with a loss of over 1,500 souls. The public's becoming panicky about traveling on British ships. The ships of other nationalities are taking all our trade. Three banks, nearly ten investment concerns with large marine interests have gone to the wall. Even Floyd is not too secure. But that is not the most serious aspect of the situation. Really? Good Lord, don't tell me there's worse to come. Much worse, Dr. Hudson. Those ships disappeared in many parts of the world. They were sunk by diverse methods. 
One factor, however, was the same in each disaster. And that was? The cargo carried by each ship was gold. English gold. Oh. If it ever became known how much British bullion lies at the bottom of the seven seas, British credit would be badly crippled. As a matter of fact, the Bank of England has been forced to import a large shipment of gold from Canada. And it's something gigantic. Good Lord, no wonder you're upset. The whole economic structure of the British Empire is at stake, Mr. Holmes. Nothing must happen to the gigantic. What makes you think anything will? A cable was sent shortly after the gigantic left Queenstown. She makes a stop in Ireland on her eastbound voyage, you know. She sails shortly before dawn this morning. The gangplanks have been drawn in, the last line have been cast off, and the great propellers have begun to churn. Suddenly the dockmaster noticed someone sliding down the ship's side on a rope. Some fool's climbed over the side. He's coming down on a rope. Go back, you fool. Go back. He'll be killed. He'll never make the dock. He'll fall in the water and be swept under the ship. No, no. He's pushing the rope away from the ship with his feet. He's swinging out. He's going to jump. He made it. Someone up on the bridge has seen him. He's calling to him. The chap picked himself up. He's shouting back. Happy New Year! Lord, I know the mantle. It's Smokey Joe, the firebird. If a gigantic don't catch fire between here and Southampton, I'm a Dutchman. Smokey Joe seems to me we've heard of him before, eh, Watson? Not merely as an expert arsonist, but a dangerous pyromaniac as well. They caught him, I hope, Mr. Pembroke. No, no, Mr. Holmes. Unfortunately, he was too quick for them. He crawled down a ladder and disappeared among the pilings under the docks. So, the gigantic is headed for Southampton with a nice bit of Joe's handiwork aboard. You think it's a firebomb, eh, Holmes? Not necessarily, Watson. There are many ingenious ways of starting a fire, you know. Whoever hired Joe would prefer to have it happen well out to sea, I imagine. Our thought exactly, Mr. Holmes. We've wireless Captain Brooks to make a search, of course, but on a ship the size of the gigantic, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. You are our one hope, Mr. Holmes. If only you couldn't get on board in time. And how do you suggest I go about that little assignment? The chairman of the Great Western Railway has placed the royal train at your disposal. All other traffic will be cleared off the tracks. Now, you should reach Land's End shortly after lunch. My yacht, the Albatross, will be waiting for you in harbour at St. Ives. Very speedy little craft, and with any luck, you should sight the gigantic around 11 o'clock tonight. Yes, 11 o'clock. Was it Smoky Joe called out? Happy New Year in hell. It won't be New Year till midnight. If we reach the gigantic by 11, we may just possibly be in time. Six bells. It's 11 o'clock. Confound this fog. We've had to reduce our speed to half. Oh, we'll never catch up to the gigantic now, Holmes. Nonsense. She's had to slow down, too. I only hope we don't miss her entirely in this fog. I don't really care. You don't sound very fit, Watson. What's up? Do you have to use that unfortunate expression? <laughs> and tell me you're feeling squeamish. It's this confounded roll. I can stand a good brisk sea, but this bobbing about in a teacup. It's Pity I didn't bring the mother sill seasick pill. Oh, mother sill. Uh, There's only one remedy for this sort of thing. What's that? Staying on shore. Jolly way to spend New Year's Eve, this is. Who do you suppose is responsible for these confounded sinkings, anyway? Mr. Pembroke seems to feel it's a foreign plot. The Middle East European shipping industries benefit the most, of course. Holmes, did you hear that? I do, yes. Sounds like an ocean liner, right enough. <laughs> Yes, we're signaling her. Scott, there she is, the gigantic looming out of the fog. Looks like a mountain coming at us. Oh, yeah. Yes, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson coming aboard. Let down a ladder. Watson, think you can manage it? I'd climb up the Eiffel Tower on a clothesline if it would get me off this bouncing copper shell.
quite an impressive array of instruments you have up here on the bridge, Captain Brooks. Yes, Mr. Holmes. On the gigantic, we have the latest of everything. And none of it's any real use in case of fire. I'd sooner face a typhoon or a shipwreck or a mutiny even, Dodd Ratchet, than a fire on board ship. Surely a ship this size should be fairly fireproof. That's what you might think, Dr. Watson. But there are three factors that make a fire on a luxury liner dangerous. First, there's all the confounded ornamental woodwork that's used in a passenger construction. Second, there's the fact that once a fire gets a firm hold, it's fed by drafts that rush through the ventilating system. And third, there is the element of panic. Nothing makes people behave more like wild beasts, quicker than the cry of fire. In case of fire, you have, of course, an alarm system. Oh, we have the old-fashioned system of bells, and also something rather recent. The Gigantic is one of the first ships to install it. You see that glass case over there, gentlemen? Uh, the one with a lot of tubes entering from below. Looks rather like a giant honeycomb, eh, Holmes? Each of those tubes leads to a separate compartment of the ship. The instant a fire breaks out anywhere... Smoke is immediately drawn into the glass case. Uh, I've stationed a sailor to watch that case. Believe me, gentlemen, the first wisp of smoke. We shall know it. Yes, undoubtedly very helpful, Captain Brooks, in the case of an ordinary conflagration. But I assure you, a fire set by Smokey Joe is not ordinary. He's a master arsonist. Ten seconds after one of his fires breaks out, you're dealing with a raging inferno. Confounded, oh, they tell me the man deserted the ship at Queenstown. That news this morning. Well, that's more than 18 hours ago. If he'd set fire, it, it seems to me that we'd be inflamed by this time. Not necessarily. There are many methods by which a fire can be made to break out long after the pyromaniac has left the scene of his crime. You say you found no time bombs, no inflammable acids. No, Mr. Holmes. Ever since I received word that we were in danger, I've had my men searching high and low. They found nothing, absolutely nothing. It's been a systematic search, I promise you. Yes, but you've drawn a blank. And that's what comes of using system instead of brains and initiative. Oh, uh -huh. And how do you propose to locate whatever it is we can't find? By using a little logic. Hmm. I shall credit Smokey Joe with having the intelligence to place his fire-starting device in the place where it'll do the most damage. The man's no amateur, Captain. He knows his business. Then I shall investigate that place and remove his handiwork. Holmes, you're bragging again. Not at all, my dear Watson. I think I may promise I shall have discovered the menace in of half an hour. I only hope Joe's little device doesn't do its nasty job before then. Half an hour. Now, 11.30 exactly. You think you can solve this problem by midnight? Yes, Captain. With any luck, I think I can promise you a placid and uneventful new year. Captain Brooks. Yes, Mr. Brown. What seems to be the trouble? The wireless engineers who wish it to report something's wrong with his apparatus. Both the sending and receiving equipment have suddenly gone out of commission. I don't like that. What does he think is the matter? me, Captain. Can you come here a minute? Hey, excuse me a moment, gentlemen. The wheelsman is calling me. What trouble, Jerry? It's the compass. It's spinning like a top. I can't figure out what's got into it. Never seen a light except once in some magnetic storm. Great Scott, this is incredible. Now what? It's the engine room calling, Captain. I'll take it. Hello? Here's Captain Brooks speaking. The blazes, you say. Well, do the best you can. Seems to be the difficulty, Captain. The dynamos are slowing down. They can't figure out why. Good Lord, sir. That's why the lights are getting dim. The blazes with the lights. Without dynamos, we've no forced draft for the furnaces. We'll never keep up enough steam pressure to drive the ship. In no time at all, we'll be drifting helplessly in the Atlantic, in the middle of the reefs that surround the Scilly Isles. Mm, jolly way to spend New Year's Eve, eh, Holmes? It could be worse, you know. How? The ship could be on fire. That's the real menace, to which these other threats are but the prelude, I fancy. Mm, for the love of heaven, what are we to do? Keep calm and use whatever intelligence the Lord has endowed us with. Captain Brooks, I suggest you and as many officers as you can spare join the holiday celebration that's undoubtedly going on in order to keep discipline in case there's any disturbance. Very good, Mr. Holmes. There's a New Year's dance going on in the large ballroom. It's on sea deck. And meanwhile, if you can spare us someone to guide Watson and myself. Oh, of course. And Mr. Brown here is our purser. He knows the ship as well as anyone aboard. I'm sure he does. Very well, Mr. Brown. If you'll lead the way, I think Dr. Watson and I would like to go below. And investigate the engines? No, Mr. Brown, even lower than that. What we're looking for is apt to be rather close to the furnaces, I imagine. <laughs> I am scared to go round and round to make me dizzy. Maybe it's the heat down here. Yes, we're getting close to the furnace room. If you listen, you can hear the stoking. Grim way to earn a living, eh, Holmes? Stop a minute. Where does that lead, Mr. Brown? That small corridor with a heavy metal door at the far end. Uh, that's the bullion room, sir, where the gold is kept. Very interesting. Suppose we take a look, eh, Watson? 
Masters, I'm always ready to see those gold bars you hear so much about. I'm afraid that won't be possible, Dr. Watson. Why not? Well, as you can see, the door is locked and sealed. It was done by the port authorities before we left New York. That door won't be opened until the port authorities unseal it when we reach Southampton. You mean that room in there wasn't opened when the captain ordered the ship searched for incendiary material? No, Mr. Holmes. But it's quite impossible for anyone to place a fire bomb or anything of the sort in there. As you can see, the seals are still intact. Quite. These seals are intact. But are they the ones put on in New York? I doubt it. Let's have a look. Yes. Interesting. Very interesting. These are not the original seals. Oh, how can you tell, Holmes? They look intact to me. Exactly. They are intact. But here in the crack of the door sill are bits of broken seals. But these seals are not even chipped. By Jove, yes, of course. The original seals were hacked off and then replaced after someone had finished picking the lock and robbing the room inside. I doubt if robbery was the motive, Watson. Well, for what other reason would anyone want to break into a room full of gold bullion? It all depends. What lies directly below that room, Mr. Brown? Well, let me see. Well, nothing of any great importance, Mr. Holmes. Just the coal piles. The coal piles? Good Lord. I think we shall have to break the seals again, Mr. Brown. Here, Watson, help me. But the door is locked, Mr. Holmes. Even after the seals have been removed, we shall have to get the key from the captain. No time for that. Hand me my burglar tools, Watson. Oh, very well. But, good heavens, you can actually pick a lock with those things. If Holmes ever turned thief, Mr. Brown, even the Bank of England wouldn't be safe. Yes, that should do the trick. Now, if you'll help me draw the bars, Watson. Yes, with pleasure. Well, there you are, Holmes. Now, let's see. Say, it's black in there, isn't it? Is there light inside, Mr. Brown? No, Mr. Holmes, I'm afraid not. Then we shall have to prop the door open. The light from the corridor will have to do for our investigations. Come on, Watson. Holmes, that smell. Phew. Strong and acrid. Like sulfur, only with more bite. Seems to be coming from this large tin. Suppose I light a match. Oh, and... Phil, stop! Don't be alarmed. I know better than to light a match around a tin which is leaking sulfuric acid. I only wanted to know how much you knew about Smokey Joe's incendiary device, Mr. Ludwig Brown, spelled B-R-A-U-N, if I'm not mistaken. So you recognize me? Yes, that dueling scar over your left eye. It's rather a giveaway, don't you know? So you have found how we are going to set fire to the ship by having the acid drip through a hole in the floor under the coal beneath. The first shovelful of that acid-soaked coal that goes in the furnace, and the hold of a ship will be a blazing inferno. Nothing could put out that fire. Don't you mean that's how you were going to start the fire? My dear Mr. Holmes, you do not think we will let a small obstacle like the famous Sherlock Holmes stand in our way. Now listen to me. Don't you raise your fist to me or I'll let you have it. Never argue with a Luger pistol, Watson. Well, that's the first sensible remark you've made, Mr. Holmes. I'm sorry to leave, but the stokers should reach the sulfuric acid impregnated coal in about ten minutes, I believe. So I must be going. This room will be a roaring oven once it starts. You'll be rather badly overdone, gentlemen. Goodbye, then. So sorry I cannot say I'll feed us in. The door. He's bolted it. Even you can't open it now, Holmes. Shut up, Watson. Help me look for the opening. What opening, for heaven's sake? The opening that leads to the tube that ends in the captain's new fire-detecting machine. It should be somewhere near the ceiling. But, Holmes, I can't see a thing in this black hole of Count Cutter. You can feel, can't you? thing, Holmes. The wall on this side of the room, it's as smooth as an egg. Confound it. If we could see for half a minute, it would... Hello, I've got something. Yes? Yes, a small grating here in the upper corner. This must be it. Now, if we can make a smudge of some sort. Watson, bring me a piece of paper. Paper? Where would I find a piece of paper? Then bring me anything I can burn. A bit of cloth, a piece of... Yes, by Jove, rope. Bring me a piece of the rope that's tied around one of the boxes that contain the bullion. Very well, if I can find the box. And... Oof. Now what? I found it. Found it. The, the knots are tied so tight. I Blazes with knots. Cut the rope, Watson. Use your pocket knife. Oh, very well. <coughs> well there you are, Holmes. It's a short length, I'm afraid. I only want enough for a smudge. Nothing like a bit of hempen rope to. Holmes, for heaven's sake, you're not going to set a match to that thing in here. There'll be an explosion. You have to take the chance, Watson. With any luck, the sulfuric acid fumes won't be too concentrated up here near the ceiling. Well? 
Here goes. One. Two. Now, if we can persuade the rope to smolder. Here, there she goes. Certainly makes plenty of smoke, eh, Holmes? The important thing is being drawn up to the grating. How long before they come to investigate, do you suppose? It all depends on the mental acumen of the sailor who's watching that fire-detecting machine. Well, let's hope he's brighter than he looks. It may be my imagination, but it seems to me I can feel the metal flooring under my feet beginning to get hot. in 1948 will cost you a great deal more than you've paid in other years. That's why it's sensational news to know that you can get Clippercraft suits in 1948 for only 40 and 45 dollars. Clippercraft top coats and overcoats for only 40 dollars, and sport jackets for only 26.50. And isn't it as good a time as any to decide to get the most for your money? You've every right to expect long hair, correct styling, good taste, comfort, and perfect fit. And you get all these to an astounding degree in Clippercraft clothes. And you get them at incredibly modest prices. It's, of course, American production genius applied to the making of fine clothes that does the trick. It's the unique Clippercraft plan, concentrating the buying power of 924 of the nation's leading independent stores from coast to coast. You get the benefit of this plan at your own locally owned store, the store you can trust. Selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway 34th. John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. Now let's rejoin Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, locked in the smoke-filled bullion room of the Gigantic. it take for them to get us out of here? That smoke's suffocating. <laughs> Calm yourself, Watson. It can't be more than three minutes since we lit this smudge. Yes, I can hear someone running down the iron staircase. <laughs> I can't hear a blasted thing. How do you... Hello? Hello in there. Get us out. We're in here. Open the door. Oh, oh what a relief. How in thunder did you two get locked in here? <coughs> What's all the smoke? No time for explanations, Captain. Stop them stoking the furnaces. Flood the coal piles with water. They've been soaked with sulfuric acid. Good Lord. Thank God. Gates, stop the firing. Stop the pumps in the engine room. Well, that's that, Holmes. What do you suppose has become of that dastardly purser? We'll let Captain Brooks take care of him, Watson. Unless I'm very much mistaken, Mr. Brown is going to wish he'd never gone to sea. Well, come along. Let's go upstairs and join the festivities. I think we rate a bottle of champagne. Well, to blazes with the champagne, I need a double brandy. Eight bells. Let's see that would be... Uh... Midnight, Watson. Happy New Year, old fellow. Happy New Year, Holmes, and many of them. But uh, don't you think you could manage to have them not quite so hair-raising? And have you getting fat and lethargic? You know, that would be unhealthy. Not to say boring. Oh, so now it's for my sake we indulge in all these horrendous escapades, eh? Plant bit of logic, that is. Elementary, my dear Watson. Elementary. But here's the ballroom. Suppose we join the party. Fine, my dear. and that was an exciting way to spend New Year's Eve. It was a bit too exciting, Mr. Harris, if you ask me. Doctor, did they catch the purser? Oh, they did indeed. 
Mr. Brown and five of his accomplices were thrown in the brig. That was the end of the disasters in the British Maritime Service. When did Holmes first suspect the person who was the villain of the piece? When he came out of the bridge and threw his overcoat on a chair near to the compass, where, whereupon the compass went berserk. Holmes was immediately suspected the coat contained a powerful magnet of some sort. And was he right, Doctor? My dear Mr. Harris, was Sherlock Holmes ever wrong? But come, fill your mug and let us wish our radio friends a prosperous, happy and peaceful New Year. Indeed we do, Doctor. And now, Dr. Watson, would you like to give us a hint about next week's story? Next week, I think I'll tell you how Holmes and I trapped a famous jewel thief right in our own rooms in Baker Street by the use of what was then a fabulous new invention, the gramophone. The makers of Clippercraft clothes and 924 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Ockren, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in... The Mazarin Stone. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcasts in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer, and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. <laughs> this is Cy Harris, speaking for Clippercraft Clothes Friends, wishing you a happy and prosperous New Year from all of us at Clippercraft. This is the world's largest network serving more than 450 radio stations. 